Hello and welcome to episode 201 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I need to say thanks to some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Mirandia Berthold, Sam, Connie Sellers, Ryan Bergstrom, Matt and Hannah White, E.K., Samantha Campbell-White and Louise Milburn. Thank you very much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is Renfield. Renfield was released in 2023. It has 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb and 57% on Rotten Tomatoes. In this modern monster tale of Dracula's loyal servant Renfield, the tortured aide to history's most narcissistic boss, is forced to procure his master's prey and do his every bidding, no matter how debased. But now, after centuries of servitude, Renfield is ready to see if there's a life outside the shadow of the Prince of Darkness. If only he can figure out how to end his codependency. So before we start this film review, I need to be very clear that when I reviewed the menu, I talked about how I do not like Nicholas Holt as an actor. I had never seen him in anything that I thought, oh yeah, you're really good in that. However, however, my opinion has changed. I stand corrected. I am a woman who is capable of self-reflection and recognising when I may have been premature in giving an opinion on something. And Nicholas Holt in this film was great. This is going to be a pretty short film review, I think, because I absolutely loved this movie. It was fun. It was silly. It was, as they say in the business, a romp. And if you ever hear me saying that word again, please, you have my permission to, I don't know, beat me up or something because that that word gives me the ick. So as the synopsis states, the whole film centres around Renfield, who is Dracula's aide, Dracula's servant, basically, and Renfield trying to break away from that codependent relationship that is really toxic. He doesn't want to do it anymore. He's had enough. He's tired. And it's so good. Like, Renfield's transformation as he finds himself and tries to break away from Dracula is so beautifully done. It's just gorgeous. And I feel like this storyline of Nicholas Holt going to a codependency group was actually kind of empowering. And it was a really, although extreme look at codependent toxic relationships, I think it was probably an accurate portrayal in terms of the traits and tropes of codependent toxic relationships. And I was here for it, you know, because within this group, you hear all these people telling their stories. Renfield gets to tell his story. And obviously, you know, there's, there's mishaps and adventures along the way. And I thought it was a really clever way to explore the relationship between Renfield and Dracula. And Nicolas Cage played Dracula, right? And again, previously, I had said that I've not actually seen Nicolas Cage in that many films. I know that he's absolutely bonkers in a lot of films. And you know what? He was perfectly cast as Dracula in this film. He was so fun as Dracula and so delightfully mad. I just loved his portrayal. And then you have Aquafina plays a... Uh, a police officer who is just trying to like take down this crime syndicate and she's also great it's a really fun movie there's so much gore but it's like ridiculous gore there's people getting exploded there's people getting their arms severed off by like serving platters at one point there's people who get their arms ripped off and then other people get beaten to death and stabbed and impaled on the arms. I mean, what more could you want from a film? And if you're somebody who, like me, doesn't like gore in films, this is exactly the type of gore that you can watch because it's so over the top and silly. It's just absolutely hilarious. And my list of dislikes for this film is actually very, very small. I watched this film with Nick and Sinead from The Poisoner's Cabinet and we had such a good time watching it. We laughed so much. It's silly. It's fun. My dislikes were that I wanted more Nicolas Cage. And I never thought I would say that. But I wanted more Nicolas Cage. I wanted more Dracula in this movie because he was so ridiculous and silly and I loved it. And if I'm being really critical, I sort of thought there was like a a storyline about a crime family within the story. And I just wasn't really arsed with it. I was like, oh, shut up. I don't really care. Like, I don't care about this crime family. I know they needed some sort of like subplot to go with the story. But I just just wasn't a massive fan, didn't think it was that well fleshed out. And I thought the bits that needed to be more fleshed out weren't like Aquafina's relationship with her sister wasn't really very fleshed out. And look, is this film like an intellectual masterpiece? No, it isn't. 
But is it really fun and entertaining and you want to keep watching? And I wanted to watch all of the characters more. Like I could have watched another hour of this film. It was it was really entertaining. And if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for a comedy horror that you can watch and have a good time watching, this is the one for you. So I, I for, for that reason, I'm going to do something that may shock people. But I'm actually going to give this film five stars. I I had a great time watching it. And I think 57% on Rotten Tomatoes is actually a really low score, similar to the 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb. You know, I think it deserves better. And that, dear listeners, might just be the shortest film review that I've done in a very long time. Some of you will be very glad of that. Which brings us to our story this week. Now, this has been a much requested story. And as you can see from the title, Our episode today is about witch trials and I don't usually talk about witch trials that often because often the stories are quite similar but every so often I do think it's important to dip back into the legends and the folklore and of course the true stories surrounding witch trials. So we are kind of looking at two different stories today so let's get into it. At the end of the 16th century A veritable witch hunting craze swept through Europe, spurred on by the new King of Scotland, James VI. Arriving with his new wife from Denmark, where witch hunts had been rife, James brought with him to Scotland his obsession with witches. In 1603, James VI became King James I of England, succeeding Queen Elizabeth. His fanaticism accompanied him to the English throne, where he proselytised that persecuting and punishing witches was an important part of good Protestant society. According to King James, to be a good Christian was to be on the lookout for witchcraft. King James was so consumed by his desire to rid his country of witches that he wrote a book on the subject. Demonology was first published in 1597 and would later be used by some to justify the accusation, torture and murder of the largely innocent people around them. But how did it all start? It was 1590, seven years before King James would publish Demonology and out at sea a storm had rocked the boat of King James and his new wife Queen Anne. The storms had been so violent and terrible that the royals were forced to seek shelter in Norway for several weeks, and interest in and fear of witchcraft had been steadily growing. Witches were responsible for the storms that had assailed the ship, and in order to root out the perpetrators, the Copenhagen witch trials began in 1590. Six women were accused of raising the storms to menace Queen Anne, and that on Halloween night they raised the devil to climb the keel of her ship. The women confessed and two were burnt as witches at Kronberg. King James was both intrigued and terrified and a lifelong fear of witches nestled deep into his psyche. If these witches could raise storms and bid the devil to destroy the ships of royalty, then no one was safe. And King James became convinced that there were witches at home in Scotland that were plotting his demise. In a small village in East Lothian, a storm was also brewing. Gillis Duncan was a servant to a wealthy household. She was a quiet, uneducated woman, and her master, David Seaton, had begun to grow suspicious. Some of the other servants had reported to him that Gillis was sneaking out of the house at night time and refused to tell anyone where she was going. Not only this, but the other servants had been suspicious of Gillis for a while. She knew things. She knew what herbs and spices could cure a cough or a cold. She knew what to do when the children of the household had upset stomachs and one servant swore. She swore that Gillis had cured her simply by holding her hands over her. So where was she going at night time? And how did she have this knowledge and these powers? David Seaton was deeply concerned and cornered Gillis one night and demanded that she explain her abilities and demanded to know where she was disappearing to at night time and Gillis just couldn't give a satisfactory answer. It is likely that there was no right answer for Gillis. The tide had turned against her. A storm was brewing and there was no holding it back. 
Gillis was tortured and eventually confessed to witchcraft. But she didn't go down alone. She brought others with her. The series of events were widely reported in the News from Scotland and in 1591 the details of the accused were printed. Agnes Sampson, the eldest witch of them all, dwelling in Haddington, Agnes Thompson of Edinburgh, Dr. Fian, alias John Cunningham, master of the school at Saltpans in Lothian, of whose life and strange acts you shall hear more largely in the end of this discourse. These were by the said Gillis Duncan accused, as also George Mott's wife, dwelling in Lothian, Robert Grierson, skipper, and Janet Blandilands, with the potter's wife of Seaton, the smith at the Brig Hallis, with innumerable others in those parts and dwelling in those bounds aforesaid, of whom some are already executed. The rest remained in prison to receive the doom of judgment at the King's Majesty's will and pleasure. Agnes Sampson was a midwife and a great healer and was known as the wise wife of Keith. Keith being the place, not the person. Her knowledge of herbs, remedies and medical procedures relating to birth was so expert that many people attributed her skill to supernatural powers and prior to this, she was revered in the community. But being different made her an easy target. The second that her name fell from Gillis Duncan's lips, her fate had been sealed. She was a witch and she was capable of raising storms at sea and unluckily for Agnes... King James himself took a special interest in her case. He wanted to come face to face with this so-called diabolical witch himself. And he was sceptical that she was even a witch at all. This woman who made pacts with the devil and could apparently control the elements. She was brought before him at a council of his nobles in Holyrood Palace and fiercely interrogated. Some stories say that Agnes denied all of the accusations and never wavered from this denial even when faced with the king and his council. But the news from Scotland reported that Agnes could tell the king about intimate conversations he had had with his queen when they were stuck in Norway. She told him things that no one could possibly have known. She quoted conversations to him directly, and they were all true. And in short, she terrified him. So whether Agnes refused to confess in front of the king or whether she somehow confessed her powers through some sort of act of psychic abilities, it's unclear. But what is clear is that she was taken to a dungeon and brutally tortured until a confession was extracted. Remarkably, Agnes was able to endure her ordeal without confessing for days. After having all of the hair shaved from her body, she was forced to stand naked, fixed against a wall by a painful oral contraption known as a witch's bridle. The witch's bridle consisted of four spikes, two that would press directly into the tongue and two that would press into the cheeks. She stood like this for four days, without sleep or sustenance. Despite this inhumane treatment, Agnes maintained her innocence, pleading with her interrogators to release her. Frustrated by Agnes's resilience to torture, her jailers upped their game and deployed the use of a garrote. Within one hour of having the noose placed around her neck and tightened, Agnes had confessed to the multitude of charges made out against her, chief of which were treason, consorting with the devil and witchcraft. She was taken from her cell, tied to a stake and slowly burned alive until she was dead. Agnes's ordeal was also written about extensively in the news from Scotland. This aforesaid Agnes Sampson, which was the elder witch, was taken and brought to Holyrood Palace before the King's Majesty and sundry other of the nobility of Scotland, where she was straightly examined. But all the persuasions which the King's Majesty used to her with the rest of his council might not provoke or induce her to confess anything, but stood stiffly in the denial of all that was laid to her charge. Whereupon they caused her to be confined away to prison, there to receive such torture as hath been lately provided for witches in that country, 
and for as much as by due examination of witchcraft and witches in Scotland, it has lately been found that the devil does generally mark them with a privy mark. By reason the witches have confessed themselves, that the devil doth lick them with his tongue in some private part of their body before he doth receive them to be his servants, which mark commonly is given them under their hair in some part of their body, whereby it may not easily be found or seen, although they be searched. And generally, so long as the mark is not seen, those which search them, so long the parties that has the mark will never confess anything. Therefore, by special commandment, Agnes Sampson had all of her hair shaven off in each part of her body, and her head constricted with a rope according to the custom of that country, being a pain most grievous, which she continued almost an hour, during which time she would not confess anything until the devil's mark was found upon her privates. Then she immediately confessed whatsoever was demanded of her, and justifying those persons aforesaid to be notorious witches. According to the news from Scotland, before her death Agnes had confessed to raising a storm that had killed a man named James Kennedy in 1589. She had created a spell by sinking a dead cat into the sea near Leith and had attached bits of dead man to the cat. The same storm had been the storm to assault the royal ship that contained King James and Queen Anne, and Agnes allegedly said in her confession that King James's ship had been hit with a, quote, contrary wind, a wind that only impacted his ship and the rest of the ships sailed ahead with ease. And this was actually true. Or it was true according to King James, who said that his ship was the only ship that was battling these strong winds and the rest of them were able to sail home without incident. But him and his new wife had to go to Norway because their ship just couldn't sail through these winds. And thus her witchcraft was justified and her death was justified. But this is not actually where our story ends, because Agnes never left Holyrood Palace. In 2014, a maintenance man was on the late shift in Holyrood Palace and was attempting to fix a broken lock. As he rattled and jiggled the offending lock, he became aware of a change in the atmosphere, almost imperceptible. He imagined later that if it had been during the day and he had had company, he likely would not have noticed it at all. But the air suddenly felt thinner and colder, and he saw a shape at the end of the hallway, barely recognisable as a human form, but becoming clearer and more solid with each passing second. The shape and form of Agnes Sampson materialised, and as the maintenance man looked on in horror, she began to limp towards him. She was naked, bloody and bald, and she moved with a slow and agonising gait, her mouth open in a silent scream of agony. The worker fell backwards and screamed at the top of his lungs, and bald Agnes disappeared. According to the website British Paranormal, another sighting of bald Agnes is rumoured to have taken place in the 1990s, during a visit by the Chancellor of Germany. According to sources, the unfortunate witness was a young German diplomat who was seen running in fear from the office he had just entered. When he was questioned as to what was wrong, he responded that he had seen a naked and transparent spectral form floating mid-air with outstretched arms. An estimated 4,000 people, of whom 84% were women, were tried as witches and two-thirds of them were executed. In 2022, the Scottish government officially pardoned those who had been accused of witchcraft and those who had been executed. But it was not just Scotland that was ablaze with talk of witches. Which brings us to the second part of our story. In the north of England stands the wild and beautiful Pendle Hill. Rising out of surrounding woodland, rivers and farmland, this area of outstanding natural beauty was once an ancient hunting ground, home to wolves, wild boar and, or so it was rumoured in local folklore, the devil himself. 
Yet people have been hunted here too. Perhaps not shot with arrows in thickets of trees or skinned and gutted on large stone tables to feed hungry mouths. But rather in witch hunts. Our second story today takes place in the northern English county of Lancashire, specifically Pendle Hill. Prior to the reign of King James, the term witch was often used interchangeably with healer or wise woman, with many local people relying on these women to deliver babies, cure ailments or just provide general comfort in times of illness and pain. Elizabeth Southerns, more commonly known as Demdike, was one such woman. Now in her old age, Demdike was considered a witch by Manny in Pendle. She lived with her adult daughter, Elizabeth Device, and her three grandchildren, James, Alison and Janet. It was not an uncommon belief that magic ran through families, so it was thought that Demdike and her whole family dabbled in witchcraft. On the 21st of March 1612, Demdike's eldest granddaughter Alison was on her way to a nearby forest when she met John Law and his son Abraham. John was a peddler, on his way from a nearby town to sell his wares in hamlets and villages. Historians argue what happened next, but what is certain is that Alison wanted some of John's metal pins. And if you don't know... In this era, metal pins were often associated with witchcraft, specifically casting love magic. Alison, for whatever reason, either tried to purchase or begged John for his supply of metal pins. It is unclear why, but he refused her. Perhaps he knew of the association between witchcraft and pins, and seeing Alison, a young woman alone by herself in the forest, thought her a perfect example of witchery. Angry with John for refusing her, Alison cursed him and she turned to walk away and John and his son continued on the country path. Moments later, Alison witnessed John suddenly stumble and then collapse to the ground. She was shocked. Had she done this? Had her curse caused a grown man to fall to the floor in agony? She felt awash with guilt and shame for what she believed she had done. It is actually thought that John had coincidentally suffered a stroke moments after leaving Alison, but she truly believed that she possessed powers of witchcraft. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? If your whole family dabble in witchcraft and the otherworldly, perhaps you would be inclined to genuinely believe you held powers beyond the natural realm. Especially if a man's literal downfall coincided with you cursing him. Alison was not initially accused of any wrongdoing, but her own feelings of guilt led her to John's bedside to beg forgiveness from him. In the eyes of Pendle's Justice of the Peace, Robert Noel, Alison's guilt was tantamount to a confession, so she, her mother and brother, were summoned to his quarters a week later, on the 30th of March 1612. Noel was excited by this. As a man loyal to his god and his king, what could surely please both more than a set of successful witch trials? Almost immediately, Alison admitted that she had sold her soul to the devil and ordered him to hurt John. Perhaps she had sold her soul, or perhaps her guilt was so much that she truly began to believe it herself. As the questioning began, the Device family did not close ranks to protect their own, as you might expect. James, Alison's brother, told Noel that his sister had also confessed to bewitching a local child. Elizabeth told Noel that her mother, Demdike, had a mark on her body that resembled a witch's mark, an intricate pattern of overlapping circles thought to represent a physical bond with the devil. And it is probably important to pause for a moment and talk about family dynamics here. These family accusations will not be the first we will hear in this story, nor the most shocking, as time has passed. Some of the key players in this story have been painted as evil or willingly manipulative for laying false charges against their own family members. 
whilst you can certainly view it that way, I don't think many of us can imagine the absolute pressure and terror that would have been experienced by these people. These people were largely uneducated peasantry, some of the most poor and destitute members of society for them. These trials became spaces in which they themselves would likely have been manipulated by those of a higher class and more education. Fear of going to hell, fear of being ostracised, of being executed could easily have led these people to act in their own best interests. Self-preservation is a powerful thing, especially when the threat of not complying with or appeasing the law is eternal damnation. As I'm sure we all know, fear can make people do terrible things, even to those they love. As accusations began to fly around Noel's quarters, Alison herself began to accuse other local women of witchcraft. Perhaps she thought that spreading the blame would lead her to experience less punishment in the end. After all, who is easier to share the blame with than other marginalised women like yourself? The two women Alison accused belonged to a rival family, Anne Whittle, known commonly as Chattox, and her daughter Anne Redfern. Like Demdike, Chattox was the matriarch of her family and known locally as a witch. The two families hated one another, partly due to a member of Chattox's family breaking and entering the device home nearly 11 years before. With these accusations, Demdike, Chattox and Anne were all summoned to Noel on the 2nd of April 1612. It's probably now a good time to mention that both Demdike and Chattox were both in their 80s and blind. It's no wonder then that they admitted to selling their souls to the devil. They didn't have any fight left in them. Anne, on the other hand, refused to confess and instead passed blame to her mother, saying she had seen Chattox making clay figurines with which to practice witchcraft. However, Anne's claims of innocence fell on deaf ears and she, Alison, and two elderly women were sent to the nearby Lancaster castle to await their trial. The following week, Elizabeth organised a meeting at the family home with a small group of locals who were sympathetic to the imprisoned women. Maybe Elizabeth felt inclined to organise this meeting as she felt guilty for laying blame so readily on her own mother. Robert Noel found out about the illicit gathering and all eight of those involved were subsequently accused of witchcraft. Seven of those people, Elizabeth James, Alice Nutter, Catherine Hewitt, John Bullcock, Jane Bullcock and Alice Gray were sent immediately to Lancaster Castle. The eighth person, a woman named Janet Preston, lived across the border in Yorkshire, so she was sent there to be tried. She was eventually found guilty of witchcraft in York and was hanged on the 29th of July 1612. One of the prisoners, Alice Nutter, is an especially unusual figure in our story as she was part of a fairly wealthy family and owned her own land. In comparison to the Device family, she was an upstanding member of the community and a woman of wealth and social standing. Some people believe she wasn't actually on her way to the Device family home at all, but rather a secret Catholic service. Catholics alongside witches were not people you were supposed to associate with in the 17th century. Alice only spoke once during her whole trial, and that was to plead not guilty. Otherwise, she remained silent perhaps to keep her fellow Lancashire Catholics safe. The official trial was held nearly four months later on the 18th of August 1612. The accused were refused their own witnesses, but the prosecution had access to their own star witness. There's one member of the Device family who we haven't spoken about since the very start of this story the youngest daughter of Elizabeth, nine-year-old Janet Device. Usually, nine-year-olds would not have been allowed to be called as witnesses, but in his book, King James had written that it was acceptable to bend normal rules when punishing and convicting witches. Thus, Janet Device took the stand and provided evidence that would eventually lead to the death of her family. 
Janet has received a pretty rough deal in many retellings of this story. She's often painted as an evil little girl, trying her hardest to destroy her own mother and brother. However, I think we all need to remember that she is literally nine years old. All those things that we looked at previously, fear, vulnerability to misdirection, self-preservation, is so much more relevant when we're talking about an actual child. While it is certainly juicier to paint her as this cruel or malevolent force, I think it's more likely that she was just very, very scared. Reports say that when Janet entered the courtroom, her mother Elizabeth screamed at her until she had to be forcibly removed so the evidence could be heard. Perhaps she too realised that the evidence given from her own daughter would ultimately be the final nail in her coffin. While giving evidence, Janet is recorded to have said, My mother is a witch and I know that to be true. I have seen her spirit in the likeness of a brown dog, which she calls Ball. The dog did ask what she would have him do and she answered that she would have him help her to kill. Of the 11 people held at Lancaster Castle, nine were hanged on the 20th of August 1612. Alice Gray was found not guilty and released, but Demdike? Demdike did not appear at the trial at all. She died due to the appalling conditions at Lancaster Castle, ending her life trapped in darkness, loneliness and squalor. After this now infamous trial, witchcraft trials in England continued for another 105 years. The last English trial was held in 1717, but the English Witchcraft Act wasn't officially repealed until 1736. Janet Device disappeared from history until the 24th of March 1634, over 20 years after giving her evidence in the Pendle Witch Trials. A woman, bearing her name, was one of 20 tried at Lancaster for the crimes of witchcraft and murder. Ironically, their trial hung on the evidence of a 10-year-old boy named Edmund Robinson. Luckily for Janet, Edmund eventually admitted to fabricating evidence and she and the others were not executed. However, it is thought that Janet died in the same way as her grandmother Demdike in the wretchedness of Lancaster Castle. In 2012, to commemorate 400 years since the trials, a statue of Alice Nutter by local artist David Palmer was unveiled in Lancashire. In 1998, a petition was presented to the British government asking for the Pendle witches to be posthumously pardoned. However, it was decided that their convictions should stand as a pardon was deemed not appropriate. The trials have since become inspiration for much of Pendle's tourism and heritage industries, with local shops selling a variety of witch-themed gifts, including a locally produced beer called Pendle Witch's Brew. Every Halloween, Pendle Hill hosts a hilltop gathering for those hoping to catch a ghostly glimpse of those executed over 400 years ago. So listen. Pendle Witches and Pendle Hill was one of the stories that was that has been hotly requested over the years. Um, and actually, when I was looking at Pendle Hill as a haunted place, like it's been named, you know, the most haunted place in the UK. There are very few actual solid stories that I could use for this episode. So there is a lot of stories about like people capturing a, you know, a photograph of a mist or people seeing lights on the hill or seeing UFOs on Pendle Hill, but no kind of solid ghost stories that I could share. So if you're thinking, God, this seems to be very, this episode is very history based. That's because, that's because it just is. And just to point out as well, there are numerous different numbers associated with this story. So looking through it, different sources say different things in relation to how many witches were were killed in the Pendle Witch Trials. And often those stories include the lady that lived across the border in Yorkshire and was tried and executed in Yorkshire. So if my numbers, if you're thinking, hang on, that's not the story that I know, I am aware that the numbers differ depending on which source you read. And I have to say, there's also an awful lot of misinformation that is printed about these stories. So I found a story of a picture that was taken in a graveyard on Pendle Hill 
um, or in in the area and they were saying, oh, this is the picture of nine year old Janet who was tried as a witch and executed. And I was like, well, she wasn't. She went on to live for quite a while, actually. So that that's not an accurate representation of the story. So in short, it's one of those ones that's really famous, but there isn't. But it's a bit of a struggle to find concrete ghost stories in order to kind of flesh out that side of the story. I know that Most Haunted did an episode on the Pendle, on Pendle Hill. Um, but also Derek Akora was still around in those episodes of Most Haunted. So we know Derek Akora was liberal with the truth, as it were. But listen, what we have to talk about is that story of Bald Agnes. What a woman, honestly, right? Her torture is described as like being horrendous. So the the news from Scotland, <laughs> it reported in great detail on these on these particular uh, on the witch trials of Kim, King James the Sixth and um, Agnes Sampson went through some serious torture. Like she had thumb screws she had all that stuff done she was dragged before the king and grilled and you know ridiculed by the king and court members and then she had that horrific witch's bridle which I had to look up what the witch's bridle actually was I had to look up what a lot of torture implements were for this episode and let's just say none of them are good and she withstood that witch's bridle for days and days and days Like, what an absolute hero. But reading about the torture and the indignation of these women and men suffered, of course they confessed. Because you'd just be thinking, this is never going to end. I need to get this over with. Like, it doesn't bear thinking about being a woman in a prison or a man in a prison and you are shaved your entire body, like the indignation of that alone. You are stripped naked. You are standing there in a witch's bridal for days on end. Obviously, you're going to be, you know, going to the toilet and stuff during that period. Like, it just doesn't even bear thinking about. So no wonder they, these people eventually confessed. I think if anyone was to torture me, I'd confess within about five seconds. I, I just, they wouldn't even get me into the torture room and I'd be like, sure, yeah, I did it, fine. I, I'm not going through this. And I will say that the the spectral image of bald Agnes that is apparently still seen at Hollyrood Palace, that's a massive no from me. Thank you. The, imagine seeing a ghost of somebody that has been shaved completely hairless their entire body. They're beaten, bruised, they're battered, they're naked, limping down a corridor towards you. Let me tell you, I, I would simply cease to exist on the spot. And I like to think of myself as somebody who is, you know, at times pretty brave and can be pretty logical and stuff. But let me tell you something for nothing. If I'm in a corridor of a palace and I see a spectral image of a woman that is bald, beaten and naked, limping down the corridor towards me with their arms outstretched, you best believe I'm jumping straight out a window. And I have to say that I still, you know, reading these stories to this day, feel that sense of frustration at the life that these women led you know the these these women that were healers and understood the ways of the land and you know were there for births and deaths and whatever you know there there's a time in their life when the community kind of rally around them and turn to them for help and then of course as soon as the the tide turns those women are the first people that are going to be accused of witchcraft and it's so frustrating to read these stories which is part of the reason why I don't do witch trial stories that often And look, do I believe that these women had like supernatural powers? No, on across all accounts of both the Pendle witch trials and the witch trials in Scotland. I don't believe these women had special powers, but they obviously had a deep understanding of the land, nature, the world around them, etc. That other people, other lay people just didn't have that same understanding. However, I will say this. There is a little part of me that's like, I kind of hope that bald Agnes did did rise up storms at sea. I kind of hope she did. I hope she, wa- like, you know, I don't want her killing cats, but I hope she found a dead cat and was like, I'm going to use this for a spell, dipped it into the ocean, and then King James I is, you know, playing rock the boat out in the middle of the sea. That's, I I want that to be a real thing. And as same with the Pendle Witches. Like, 
I understand that these these were marginalised women and these families were marginalised. They were poor. They had little education. But do I kind of want the stories about them to be true a little bit? And I'm going to be honest, there is absolutely no part of me that believes that Janet was some sort of evil mastermind. She obviously was just trying to survive. I think all of them were trying to survive. And I think when witches kind of accused other people... They were just trying to survive and trying to dilute the blame somewhat. So if there's loads of them that are accused, then maybe all of them won't die. And I guess it's also important to point out that actually people are still accused of witchcraft and people are still murdered for these accusations of witchcraft to this day. It is not something that is consigned to the past. And while we don't have these big witch trials in England and in Scotland and in mainland Europe and America like happened all those years ago there are still places in the world where being accused of witchcraft can mean a death sentence. So in short boo to the witch trials. Bald Agnes was pretty badass and I don't want to see her ghost anytime soon and little Janet I don't think she was evil. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode and just to say there's a huge amount of information about the Pendle witch trials and of course James the first slash James the sixth, whatever he was known as. And you can't, I can't get it all into one episode. So if I feel, if you feel like I've skimmed over some of the important historical context, etc., it is just because it's a, uh, we're, we're time limited, okay? Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you want to send in your own story, you can do so by emailing it to real life ghost stories podcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website real life ghost stories podcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time.